You're listening to the Four Climate Tech series on the Forward Faster podcast, providing bite-sized insights for climate tech innovators. Hi, and welcome to Forward Faster. I'm Chris Carpenter from the marketing team at NextCore and Venture for Climate Tech. With me today is David Goldstein, founder and CEO of Hydronic Shell Technologies. Thanks for joining me today, David. Yes, absolutely. Thanks for having me. David, I'm going to dive right in with first, can you explain to me what Hydronic Shell is and what your technology is? Yeah. So Hydronic Shell is a system for retrofitting existing buildings with the idea of decarbonizing them and modernizing them. And so there's really two key elements to doing that. One is the HVAC systems, HVAC meaning the heating, the ventilation and air conditioning systems in the building. And then the second piece of it is the facade, updating the exterior skin of the building. And so the way we make this happen is we're essentially wrapping the existing building in a new exterior skin. And that skin is doing two things. One, it's insulated. uh, So it's making the building more efficient, less leaky, uh, just with that new facade. Then the other piece of it is actually integrating the HVAC into that exterior skin. So now the two essentially become one combined system. And the key is that it can now be installed from the exterior of the building, making it non-invasive. And really our innovation, our technology is building on existing technology. So the, the facade piece of it really already exists. So people are already today wrapping buildings in new facades uh, in order to make them more efficient. And we're kind of taking the next step in that process and saying, okay, that technology exists. Let's take it one step further and integrate the HVAC into it. The other key element of the way we do it is that we do it with prefabricated modular components, meaning that this new outer shell that's going around the building is using prefabricated panels that are made in a factory super efficiently, quickly, and assembled at the job site, essentially like Lego pieces around the building. So what it does is it really makes it much more cost effective, because that's one of the major challenges with these retrofits is how to make them cost effective. And it reduces the amount of labor on site because workforce shortages are another huge problem. Uh, So it's really uh, addressing many of those issues. Wow. So it's like a full system you're just wrapping up around an an older building. Exactly. That's pretty cool. So, I mean, you kind of mentioned this before that folks have been doing this in different ways, but how did Hydronic Shell come to be? Like, like, what's your background and how did you kind of add the HVAC portion into this? Yeah. So, you know, it's kind of interesting how this came to be. I just kind of happened to be at the right place at the right time for a number of different things that were going on in the industry. So I'm I'm located uh, here in New York City, and my background is that I'm a mechanical engineer, and I I spent about 15 years designing HVAC systems. And a few years ago, I found myself working on a project to do one of these decarbonization retrofits on a large multifamily building. And that's what really exposed me uh, to the challenges in doing that type of project. Uh, Biggest challenge, honestly, was just the fact that doing the work was just too invasive, you know, because we're doing these retrofits in occupied buildings. And when we're talking about a multifamily building, it's people's homes. You know, we're talking about doing work in their living rooms, in their bedrooms. And the idea of sending contractors in to do that throughout the building, by seeing it firsthand, I realized how difficult it is almost impossible, really, especially on a larger building. And so that was when I kind of came to the conclusion, there's no way we're going to make these retrofits happen unless we can figure out how to take the HVAC out of the interior of the building and how to make it uh, fit into the, the facade on the exterior of the building. And I was really surprised because when I had that realization, I kind of assumed someone else would already be working on that. But I kind of just Googled it, you know, and there was nothing, you know, nobody was doing it. It was, it was shocking to me, but I said, well, it was clear it needed to happen. And if nobody's going to do it, then I guess I need to do it. So that kind of started me on my journey. Um, I ended up quitting my job, patented this new technology to make this happen. Uh, and that's really how it all started. So does the exterior HVAC system just kind of plug into the existing HVAC system of the building? Or can you kind of describe to me what this looks like and how it works? Yeah. 
Absolutely. So what it actually looks like if you're standing on the exterior of the building and looking at this building after a retrofit happens, all you actually see is a brand new beautiful facade around the building. Uh, the total thickness of this new facade is about 12 inches. So the building gets a teeny bit fatter, um, but it has this new beautiful facade that can essentially look however the people in the building want it to look or however the building owner wants it to look, you know, in terms of the aesthetic of it. But what's actually happening, the actual HVAC piece of it is is hidden within that new facade. So it's all happening behind the scenes. The idea is we're improving their indoor air quality. We're improving their comfort, their efficiency and everything. But really, from the user perspective, um, from the exterior perspective, all you see is this beautiful, modern looking new building. Uh, and so the way it happens is we actually have new central HVAC equipment that's generating the ventilation air, conditioning it, creating hot water and chilled water to condition the space. And all that piping and ductwork is running in that new facade uh, hidden from the exterior. That's pretty cool. That's uh, it's no small feat, it sounds like. Nope. So where do you see these being initially implemented? So the, the ideal kind of building for this is really your typical affordable housing multifamily building constructed prior to 1980. Uh, the reason I say 1980 is because that's when energy codes really came into existence. So all these buildings that were built prior to 1980 are essentially super inefficient, uh, you know, major problems in terms of emissions and uh, just poor indoor air quality uh, and all that sort of thing. So the affordable housing, these older affordable housing buildings are really where it's needed most. Plus, the typology of those buildings is really ideal for this kind of retrofit because they have, they actually have robust structures. You know, they're masonry, concrete, steel. They can support the weight of this new exterior facade without a problem. And they have this punched window kind of arrangement with adequate space between the windows so that we can run all that HVAC distribution uh, in that space. So it really is an ideal place for us to start with the technology. Plus, you know, for our first projects, we anticipate we'll be relying on grants a lot to fund these projects. And there are just more grant opportunities when you're talking about rehabilitating affordable housing compared to other types of buildings. For sure. Yeah. In terms of where it's going to happen, we're actually planning our first project in Syracuse, New York. Even though there's a huge market for it here in New York City, New York City can be complicated. <laughs> so we're probably going to do this more in a smaller city like Syracuse to start where there's a little bit less red tape before we make our move to New York City. I'm sure every city has got buildings that could use an upgrade or two, especially the public housing stuff. So that's a pretty big win for getting the Syracuse stuff going. Uh, when did that news happen? Well, it's not official yet. So we we kind of just over the last, I would say, six months or so kind of made this connection with the, the Syracuse Housing Authority, which is the public housing agency there. And we're able to assemble this incredible team to make this project happen, uh, including an amazing architecture firm called Cycle Retrotech and Block Power. And we're working with Syracuse University on it. So we're able to assemble this really incredible team to deliver this project. The, the, the people at Syracuse Housing Authority are amazing and, and very supportive of this. And so the last piece of the puzzle is actually the funding for the project. We're actually finalists in this competition to get the funding for this project. And we're hopeful that it'll come through. Um, but, you know, you can never be sure about that sort of thing. But ultimately, even if this particular opportunity doesn't come through, there will be plenty more opportunities out there. And so, you know, eventually we'll find the funding and we will make it happen. Amazing. Yeah, I mean, HVAC is such a large player, I think, in the climate sphere between coming demand and then like what it like just upgrading existing systems like you do today. So I was curious from your perspective between working on these systems and as a mechanical engineer, what are some of like the larger obstacles the HVAC world is facing when it comes to meeting the demands of a changing climate? Yeah, I mean, this is, it's a huge challenge for the HVAC industry. And, you know, the HVAC industry kind of finds itself at the center of a lot of challenges, whether it's addressing climate change and reducing emissions or improving indoor air quality, you know, things like when COVID happened or when these wildfires happened and all of a sudden everyone cares a lot about uh, indoor air quality. So there's kind of a lot resting on the shoulders of the HVAC industry right now. And it is a big challenge. And part of the challenge 
is that there's so much focus that needs to happen on retrofits and especially retrofits of occupied buildings, uh, which is really a new challenge for our industry. And so right now, the HVAC world doesn't really have the tools to address this yet because it's so new. Uh, and so we really need to figure it out and develop these new kind of solutions that are that are actually going to make this possible and help us solve this problem. So it, it requires innovation, you know, new ways of thinking. But the construction industry in general, including the HVAC industry, are really very risk averse. Uh, that's just the way they've always been and for good reason. But we are at a time where we need bold action if we're going to solve this problem. And so the HVAC industry does have challenges uh, in addressing it. But fortunately, they are starting to move, uh, starting to help figure out solutions. And that's obviously what we're doing is really doing our best to try to push the industry forward so that we can solve these problems in our lifetime. Thanks for sharing that. That's great. The HVAC world is such an enigma to me. So anytime we can get anybody who has some insight, it's uh, it's incredibly valuable. And I'm curious, you know, we just had the uh, Venture for Climate Tech Innovation Showcase, and you're talking about these projects going on in Syracuse. But I was wondering, you know, what's next for Hydronic Shell? What's the next target for you all? Right now, we're laser focused on getting our first demonstration project. So I mentioned the opportunity in Syracuse, uh, and that's a big one, but there's also several other potential opportunities that we're looking at to be our first demonstration project. That really is the key for us because, you know, I've been working on this for a few years now. I'm a very technical person. I know this is going to work, but not everyone else knows it's going to work. You can't expect other people to do that kind of technical deep analysis to decide for themselves that this is going to work. We need to show them it's going to work. So it, the key to us is really delivering that first demonstration project. And then after that, we think, you know, huge doors are going to open for us to, to grow and scale from there. So that really is our main focus right now. The other big focus we have, and it all ties in with the demonstration project, is forming the right partnerships to actually make these projects happen. Because, you know, we're, we're a small startup and construction is big and it's complicated we're not doing this by ourselves. You know, I mentioned the team that we we have for that Syracuse project. It really takes a lot of the right partners to make uh, something like this come together. So we're always actively looking to develop new partnerships, whether it's on the technology side and working with facade manufacturers or HVAC manufacturers, also working with architects and engineers and really pulling those teams together to make these projects happen. So th those are really our two main focuses right now. Awesome. Wow. I mean, it sounds like you guys got your hands full. Kind of pivoting more to your own personal founder journey here. You know, startup life is hard. And so I'd be curious, what lesson or piece of advice from your own journey uh, would you share with other founders? Probably the most important thing that I've found and for me anyway, one of the most challenging things is, you know, obviously you need to have a good solution, whether it's technology or a business model, obviously it has to work and the market has to be there. Um, but given all that, one of the most important things is really learning how to tell your story. And for me, and I think for anyone, it's a big challenge because it's not just telling one story. You have to be able to tell your story in many different ways to many different types of people. So it's it's something that is super important. And I know for me, it's constantly changing. You know, if you listen to me talk today versus a year ago, the way I explain things is totally different. But really, you know, as a as a CEO, as a founder, most of what I'm doing is telling a story, you know, whether it's a podcast like this, or if it's doing a 90 second pitch, or if it's an eight minute pitch, even writing a grant, at the end of the day, you're telling a story of why you should get this funding, you know, why there's a need, what you're going to do with it. So the storytelling aspect of it is super important. And part of refining your story is telling the story and then seeing what kind of feedback you get, what kind of questions you get and realizing like, oh, well, you know, maybe I'm not telling this right because when people ask me questions, they don't seem to be understanding this aspect or that aspect. So it's just, it's a constant effort to tell your story better and better so that you can open up more and more opportunities. It's a perfect note to end on. Thanks so much for, uh, for sharing your story with us today, David. I really appreciate it. Yeah. 
So you can follow us more at Ford Faster at nextcore.org. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And thanks again, David, for joining us today. We'll see you next time on the Ford Faster podcast. Thank you.